Thank you. Um, I don't think I need a microphone. I think I'm, I'm loud enough. Um, and because we're a small group, I think it would be nice if you actually join in the conversation. If you have any questions, don't wait till the end. Give me a shout. Um, if there's any topics in specific that you would like maybe to look into, then we can come back to those afterwards. Otherwise, we'll just let the flow of the questions. By all means, go ahead. So my name is Julie Back. Um, I've been in Thailand 17 years. Um, and uh, whatever business I've either worked for or owned, I've always tried to incorporate sustainability, um, not just uh, about recycling or reducing, but actually looking at all aspects of whatever we do and how it impacts our surroundings and the people that we're um, uh, working with or working on behalf of. So um, the reason I decided to, decided to cover this as a, uh, a talking point today was um, we're living in Thailand, we're part of ASEAN, which has got uh, a very, 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 very large increase in tourism numbers on a yearly basis. And at the same time, um, I've worked in the tourism industry, and we're hearing from agents overseas that Thailand is now a hard destination to sell because of the mess or because of the problem. Um, but again, a lot of these problems have occurred over the years as tourism has grown and grown and grown. So a lot of people have benefited from the financial aspects of tourism, but without taking responsibility for the impact of tourism. So um, obviously, I'm sure you all know that uh, um, there's a lot of focus on uh, the World Tourism Authority, um, the UN, WHO, all of these bodies that are basically pushing um, even in Thailand now, DASTA um, have been GSPT certified in order to implement the rules and regulations that are needed to create uh, a healthy model of, of tourism. So, eco tented camps are just overwatered and a lot of care needs to go into them. Uh, an eco-tented camp um, needs to be mainly non-permanent. So the idea is that they put in, um, let's say, walkways that are elevated above ground level so that they're not work walking on the ground. Uh, they would put in foundations to support a platform that can have a tent put on it and a private bathroom, that's okay. But the idea is that if you dismantle everything, you haven't destroyed the entire location while you're building. So everything can just be taken away. Yes, they do tend to have like a, a community area or a main area where people can come and eat and talk and socialize. Um, but the, the real focus is that they are not um, causing any long-term damage from the development stage through to actual operations and then if they close or if they maybe are only there for six months of the year because six months of the year it's a floodplain or you know monsoon season. But a lot of the, the um, uh, eco-accommodations that we see across the range tend to be permanent 
or they have permanent foundations. Um, the way that they are connected to the main uh, electricity supplies, water supplies, waste supplies, sewage supplies, means that it's not actually a sustainable model and it's having a negative impact on um, the, the local environment. Another thing about ETCs is that they are, they tend to be in very uh, underpopulated areas, remote areas. Um, I, I'll show you a lot of statistics afterwards. Um, whereas some of the, you know, glamping, the luxury tented camps that we see are a big trend now, they tend to be in areas that are already in demand because that's the customer base. So it's an alternative to what's existing, but it doesn't mean it's a sustainable model. Um, especially not in, uh, if you think about some of the very large hotel groups that have, you know, seen that there's a, a demand for glamping and they've gone in and created these amazing, I mean, they're beautiful, don't get me wrong, but if you look at the impact, it's not, it's not a, a module that can sustain itself. Um, because once that area, sorry? Glamping. So glamping is glamorous camping, which was a trend that was started actually uh, in Africa. Uh, where people, yes, where, so glamorous camp camping actually started out um, because there were people on safari that wanted a hot bath and they wanted a fan and they wanted air conditioning. So they wanted all the facilities while they were on safari. So they literally started building a, a tent or a, uh, a semi-permanent building that had all the facilities of a five-star luxury hotel. Um, so one of the points I, I, I the, one of the reasons I really like the idea of an eco-tented camp is because it allows development um, in rural destinations or up-and-coming destinations without having to focus on heavy, heavy infrastructure. And you're looking at carrying capacity as well. One of the main things to remember about eco-tented camps, they need to be small. On average, I would say not more than, um, I, think, I think the statistic now is about 19 maximum tents. Some of them might be 25, some of them might only have eight. But the idea is to keep it very small so that you can limit the carrying capacity of how many people are on that location on a daily basis. Not just what they're doing there, but how do they get there? What happens when they leave? So this is the main focus of an eco-tent eco camp. Um, the main differences between eco lodges, green hotels, glamping resorts, etc., we call it eco accommodation, is the fact that. Um, okay. So, eco lodges, um, they tend to be small to medium sized, they tend to be in remote natural areas. Um, they're focusing on conservation because without protecting what's around them, they are not going to survive. The problem with eco lodges, it tends to be proper buildings. They tend to be permanent cabins, um, meaning that they've built foundations, meaning that they've had to bring in all the building supplies, meaning that they bring in proper specialists to actually build. Uh, you can't take a local, build, a local worker to build a bungalow, but you could take a local worker and show him how to use the same system that he built his home with platforms and stairs and then put up a tent. So uh, eco lodges also tend to be um, foreign investment. They're not always local investment. Um, and they're a kind of mid-range investment. If you think about how much money has to be put in in order to start making, taking money out. The problem with eco lodges, again, because they're not looking at um, a sustainable module, they are very often, they don't have their own water supplies, not all of them. If they're built in a jungle, they can't use solar. So they might have um, um, black pipes on the roof for heating water in the day, but they need sunshine for solar. If they're in a very heavily wooded area, they can't put in uh, windmills for, for um, alternative uh, energy. And um, they cannot control what's happening in the vicinity. So if the village nearby starts cutting down all the trees, their business is kind of going to have a problem. If uh, local poachers are coming in and, and taking all the wildlife, again, the eco lodge is going to have a problem. Um, green hotels, which of course I think everybody knows, big, uh, medium to big, permanent buildings, the normal module of a hotel, four star, five star, um, could be very beautiful, 
but they are working on in initiating sustainability practices within the hotel. So they look at you know, waste reduction, they look at recycling, they look at uh, food waste reduction, and they work, work towards getting accreditation from globally recognized bodies like Travel Life, like um, uh, Greenleaf, GSTC, um, so that they can promote themselves as a green hotel. But what we very often find in green hotels is just because they put a sign up saying, don't change my sheets every day, doesn't mean that they've trained the staff not to change the sheets. So saying that you're one thing and getting the accreditation, if we look at actually how the module works, it's better than a normal operating hotel, but it's not quite there yet. And again, these tend to be in highly touristic destinations, very popular. There's a reason why they put all this big money into these hotels is because they know that they're going to get the high-end clientele that are willing to pay for it. Um, glamping resorts, so again, glamorous camping, <laughs> for, to, to make sure that you understand the, the meaning of it. Um, they tend to mix permanent structures and tented accommodation, but again, they will actually build big swimming pools and you know very, very nice facilities, but just because it's glamping and there's a tent involved doesn't mean it's sustainable because these are popping up on high-end beaches around the world, in, as I said, safaris in Africa, but actually their impact is negative because they have to bring everything there. It's high electricity, high water, a lot of waste. So just because it looks like an eco-tented camp doesn't mean it is. And then the last of the four modules that we're talking about, that I'm comparing to, uh, the ETC. So again, um, these can, Investment-wise, it's a very small investment for a very fast return. Um, you can have it as a basic eco-tented camp, or you can go all the way up to the top, like the, the Bill ben Bentley collections, which are basically five-star hotels with a, a fabric um, um, structure surrounding them. Um, any questions about any, any, everybody understand now what we're talking about when we say an ETC? Yes. This, this back the slide just back there. That hotel on the right. That's that looks like a completely fixed structure to me. So this is the, the, the that's actually the glamping a, resort. It's yeah. a glamping resort. So this is built on stilts. The majority of the whole property is actually built above ground. It's built on stilts, uh, but all of the restaurants, the reception, the bathrooms, everything else is actually fully blown permanent structures. So on the stilts, you can see at the top, they've actually got the, the fabric, the tent, right? So that makes it... Yeah. So, so makes this it is why it's a, it's, it's a tent. Okay. It's a tent. But right. they've got actual doors and windows and air conditioning yeah. and running water yeah. and jacuzzis and... And they've got to have some drainage, some wastewater. So exactly. Yeah. But again, because these tend to be in... They are, will be in beautiful locations, but they're really locations that are popular and very often already reach carrying capacity. So it's much easier to build something like this on a small piece of land because they can't, there's no place to build big hotels. Or um, there's already limitations on, on how high they can go. Sure. Or there's already been enough problems with uh, beach encroachment because you know the, the big hotels tend to get pride of pay, place. So these kind of fit in somewhere between those that have got the money to spend and want luxury but want to feel that they've got a little bit more of a, a unique experience. Um, and glamping resorts don't tend to be too big. You, you, they'll be probably between 15 to 30 um, units versus eco-tented camps, which are normally not more than 20. Um, obviously, green hotels, which will have hundreds of rooms. And um, uh, eco-lodges, which there are eco-lodges now that actually have 50, 60 cabins. So again, they're removing the natural environment in order to expand, um, great. A lot of the money that comes in does reach uh, the local community because they'll hire locally, they'll train locally. Um, they will um, look at um, getting the, the food from the local suppliers. So they, there is money going back into the, the local environment um, and it can benefit the conservation efforts but they're actually having a ne negative impact while they're trying to have a positive impact. Um, so, 
Uh, ETC is actually started in Africa. They are a very, very, very popular model in the Americas, in, the, in Africa, um, for about 50 years, actually. So they're not a new design. They're not a new development. But in the last 15 years, because of um, the demand and the, the uh, constantly growing demand of tourists, that they want something that's more environmentally friendly, that's a bit more remote, uh, that's unique. They want something with a personal touch. They want a different experience. And a lot of them will say, okay, well, if I'm going to spend $200 on a five-star hotel, I, if I pay $250 and that extra $50 is doing something good, I would rather have that option. The problem, I think, is a lot of tourists want something more sustainable and they want to feel good about the choices that they're making, but they don't know or don't understand what options are available to them. Um, based on the information that's been collected, there's been a lot of research done on ETCs in other countries. Um, I have focused on ETCs for ASEAN. Um, so some of the market trends uh, when we're looking at the, at the ETC market is property owners typically limit the total number of tents per project to provide an exclusive environment, unique product, and design, often, um, a design offering which is different to traditional hotels. So something else about ETCs, it tends to be local investors. So because it's a remote location, the land is very often owned by local families. So it's, they don't need a big foreign group behind them to build because it's a low investment. It's not expensive to set up. And of course, you can set it up, and as the business makes money, you can grow and you can improve. You can, you can add nicer facilities, but you're not having a negative impact in doing so. Um, and with, um, with ETCs as well, because it's local investment, the money stays in the local areas, whereas with foreign investment, very often the money gets taken out of the country and it doesn't go back in to um, sustaining the three pillars of people, planet, and profit. Um, to preserve the unique experience, strict age limits are commonly imposed, which impact segmentation. So one of the things we've noticed in ETCs is because they are in remote areas, there are no um, hospitals down the road. Some of them are very difficult to get to. Um, some of them you can only get to by boat. Some of them you need a special car um, that only comes once or twice a day. So they aren't necessarily friendly for children under the age of 10, for example. So it's a great product to promote to families or to you know cousins and aunts all come together. But one of the things to remember that it isn't necessarily suitable for very young children that might need medical attention, that could get hurt in the wilderness, on the beach, in the forest. Um, sometimes we've seen that there are families that say, okay, my child has traveled well, she's been trekking, and then it's okay. If she's eight or, or something like that, then they'll make allowances. And then again, it goes the other way. Having people with um, mobility issues can limit um, them being considered suitable guests. Um, some of the eco-tented camps are very suitable for people with handicaps within the local vicinity. So they've made ramps and they've made handicapped access bathrooms, but they would not be able to participate in a lot of the activities that are part of what ETCs offer. So it's not just about the accommodation, it's about all the other activities that they offer. So whether it's trekking, whether it's actually going out um, to help uh, with animal trekking, um, helping setting up photo traps. So it's not just about I'm staying in a camp in the middle of the forest or I'm staying in an in a, in a eco-tented camp on the beach. It's about what are we going to do when we're there. And this is what people are paying for. This is where the money, why the investment versus the returns is, is, is pretty good. Um, uh, international luxury brands like Four Seasons and Amman are two groups that featured tented properties in Southeast Asia, which were there first. So these are two very, very big hotel groups that have multiple properties across ASEAN that went, oh, there's so much demand for it, and there's, there's more people asking for it, but there's not enough actual ETCs to supply the demand. So they went, they opened the one up in Chiang Rai, um, you know, Anantara Golden Triangle. That's a tented luxury camp, but they are sustainable because of the way that they've done it from, from the ground up. 
Um, and of course, they've got all the elephant mitigation there and other things that they're involved in. But it was their first, it was the first of its kind. So if the big brands are noticing it, it's kind of, well, we don't want the big brands coming in and doing all the investment and building the ETCs. We want to keep them as local as possible because it's a model that's affordable and the benefits stay within the country and the region. Um, the current forward outlook. Um, so again, more mainstream developers embracing the product due to high investment returns from low capital cost, shortened development period and flexible format. Again, a big hotel, a uh, uh, green hotel, a glamping resort, an eco resort. They need architects to come in and actually build infrastructure. They need a certain system in place in order to, to operate. Because ETCs tend to be small, they also fall under different criteria within uh, rules and regulations. Um, they're much quicker to set up. It doesn't take years and years and years to build like some of these big developments. These can literally be built, be built in a six month period. Um, and flexible format, meaning you can look at the lay of the land and what's there and then design in between the trees rather than cutting them down rather than having to clear entire areas to make beautiful views, well, you don't need to clear anything. You need to keep as, keep as much natural um, uh, plant life and, and resources in the area, and you fit in to that, rather than changing it all to, to suit your own, your own design needs. Um, emerging destinations, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, um, they're now seeing the first ETCs that have been opening in the last couple of years. Um, and again, it's a really, really, really easy business module for them to implement because they don't have to have a big road built. They, c they can get there by boat or they can get there by trekking or they can get there from just a small pathway rather than the other modules where they have to bring in huge amounts of infrastructure in order to set up the underground side of what's going to you know, facilitate the operations of the, the eco-accommodation. Um, so again, it's allowing locals to actually own a property. Um, it allows them to develop using local wisdom and local knowledge, and then add all the fluff, as we call, like all the, the pretty things can come afterwards. Um, it's allowing them not to have to connect to the main grid. So they don't have to wait 10 years to get electricity. They don't need big, loud generators that use a lot of fossil fuels, um, whether it's LPG or, or NGV or um, diesel, um, they can set up wind turbines, they can set up solar panels. And because it's from the beginning, you, it's very easy to set up storage areas. It's very easy to um, think about everything that they're going to need and how they can provide it for themselves so they become self-sufficient. Um, with ETCs, you can grow your own food as long as you, contro you can control it so that you're not spreading it out into the environment. You don't really want wild rocket growing instead of orchids in the next 10 years. Um, but you can actually grow a lot of the, the things that you need on a daily basis, herbs, vegetables. Um, and then, of course, you go to the local communities to get everything else that you need in order to, to provide uh, food for your customers, handcrafts, all the niceties in, in, in the tents. Chances are the local village is making baskets. It's making traditional handmade items that they use for themselves. So you're providing them with a business opportunity. And um, it, again, innovative, uh, innovative product design and programming into niches like wellness, tree houses, active sports are expected to boost future growth. So with the ETC module, you look at where you build it and you look at what activities you can offer in the vicinity. So it's not like staying in a hotel and then going on a three hour trip to go and see Ayutthaya yeah, and then come back to Bangkok, right? Here, everything is done on site or in the immediate vicinity. So ETCs in ASEAN are now waking up and going, oh, we can offer cooking classes in the local village, or we can bring the lady from the local village to actually do the cooking classes on site. What do we do with our food waste? Oh, we can make our own gas for cooking. There's now a wonderful little tent. You put all your food waste in there. It produces fertilizer and gas for cooking. So it's a small enough unit that you can operate it in a resort of 20, of 20 tents. Um, so you're preventing 
anything from going back into your environment. Um, you can also then educate the locals in the community about food waste, about um, circular industry, that everything that you produce that you can't use yourself, it can be given to them. So if you can't use all your food waste, use it for pig food. Give it to the local farmers. Give it back to them to use for their pigs. Um, things like fishing. Yes, you can order fish from the local um, suppliers. Or you could basically ask one of the villagers to look after the fish for you. So that instead of having to get fish from the sea or from a remote location, you actually show someone in the village how to breed fish. It provides food for themselves, but it also means you're affecting your supply chain and you're having less of an impact and, and less you know, carbon damage by bringing everything onto the site. So the more that is done in the immediate vicinity, the, the more positive impact you actually have. Um, at the moment, um, there are quite a few new properties that are going to be opening up uh, across ASEAN. Um, we have a couple already existing in Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia, and Philippines. And in every single one of the countries, if there is more than one at the moment, there's at least four that are being, going to be opening in the next 18 months. So Thailand, there's going to be 14 opening in the next year and a half. Uh, Myanmar, there's four. Laos, they've just opened two, and there's two more coming. So if all of these countries that have never heard of ETCs before, and it hasn't been a big trend in the last 10 years, why is it over the last couple of years that they're just popping up everywhere? It's because the demand for them is increasing so much. Um, just so you know about prices, so you were correct in, in talking about the different levels. But if you think um, that, let's say, a five-star hotel, hotel in Bangkok, you can get a five-star hotel in Bangkok now for 3,000 baht a night for about $100. The average rack rate for um, uh, ASEAN uh, ETCs is around $340 a night. So that's for the tent. Could be two people, it might be three. And on average, it's $270 a night in Thailand, which actually means that it's more expensive than a five-star hotel. So yes, it includes activities, it includes food, but people are willing to pay these prices to go to a remote destination that's small, that's exclusive, it's a unique experience that they actually feel that they're contributing and they see that their money actually keeps the forest standing or keeps the beach clean or takes care of the local community because they can see the impact that, that this money is having. Whereas if you go and put the $100 in a five-star hotel, you don't know where that money goes. You know, it goes into a business. You don't know what impact you're having. You have no direct connection to your local um, community or the, even the area that the hotel is built in. So it's just a place to stay, whereas here it's, it's, a, it's a lot more. Yes? There's a group, the Monkeys of the Rainforest or something or other, that where they, they ride around on chains in the, in the jungle. Flight of the Gibbon? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? yeah. Is that? Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. I don't, I don't, I don't <laughs> monkey on chains, Flight of the Gibbon. Yeah, I was like, the Monkeys on chains. Touch, obviously. Uh, are, th are those facilities considered echo? Okay, so there's been, there's been there's different modules of, like everyone basically started copying Flight of the Gibbon. The original Flight of the Gibbon is actually very sustainable because everything's been built on platforms and wires. So you're not actually walking across the entire forest floor or you're not breaking the, the canopies. It's like a pathway. It's the same as a diver when we used to cut pathways in the reef. So we would destroy that one little section of reef, and that would be the only place you were allowed in and out to stop them walking on the other parts of the reef. So in that, in that, in that way, it is sustainable. And, but it's not a business that focuses on um, inclusiveness and bringing everybody into the community. It still works as a, as a business module, as in we've invested, we are making money. But they do train and hire local guides. Um, they do actually teach, you know, conservation and, you know, love of wildlife and biodiversity, but it's, um, it's, not a, it's not a business model that was built on sustainability. It benefited from conservation. So it's more like the eco-lodge than, than the ETC. Because if the, if the environment isn't taken care of, no one's going to fly through the canopies, right? 
Um, okay, so any other questions? No? Okay, so um, market overview. Um, this is the tiers. This is kind of the, the, the types of ETCs that we see at the moment. You have luxury, upscale, midscale, budget, and economy. The 53% of the share at the moment is upscale. So it's not the, the very, very, very high end. It's kind of the, the, the medium to high range where they have their own bathroom, you know, with hot water, and they have electricity on at least 12 hours a day. Some of it will run on solar panels. Sometimes during um, winter months, when there's not enough sun in the day, they'll use the batteries that have stored the energy, but then they'll only put them on at night, so they won't have it running in the day. Um, but it tends to have all the, the nice amenities that you would have in a, in a normal hotel. Um, Whereas the luxury is like five star, just anything you can imagine, jacuzzi, uh, literally a jacuzzi bathtub inside the tent um, with a mini bar and room service and everything you could need. Um, the midster ones tend to be um, less focused on technology, so they won't have Wi-Fi. You know, they're very often remote, so your 3G doesn't work either. Um, you know, there might be a, a phone box or a, a telephone that is connected to a little satellite so that they can actually have calls coming in and out, and you can make calls as well, but it's not like um, uh, the luxury ones, let's put that in. And there won't be any, like, TVs in the rooms. There won't be hi-fi and music playing in the community area because they want to keep the, the noise pollution down as well. Um, and then the budget and economy ones will literally be Kind of, as a, kind of like going tent camping by yourself. You know, you take your tent, you take your sleeping bag, and it's going to be a mattress on, the, on a platform with a tent surrounding it that you tend to wake up quite wet in the morning because of the, the condensation. So it's the quality of the tent and the facilities. Um, but it's interesting that it's actually the upscale uh, that has taken over the, the, the trend. So people are realizing, I can charge another $50 a night just by making it look nicer. <laughs> Sometimes they have the same facilities. It's just, oh, look, it, it's, it's got three night lights instead of just one. I could charge more money. Um, another nice thing about tents, of course, uh, and especially with all the development, is that they can actually be made from uh, natural fibered fa fabrics. So they're making them again from hemp, wonderful product. Um, they're making them from uh, bamboo fabric, which is, uh, it retains its. Um, antiseptic uh, properties. Uh, so even the materials being used to build the ETCs can be 100% environmentally friendly and from a, a sustainable source. Um, with regards to locations that you'll find ETCs now, not countries, but actually locations, the most popular one is the forest because it tends to be remote. It's more difficult for people to actually go and explore by themselves. So having like a base camp in the middle of a forest where you can go out and go trekking or you can go kayaking and really listen and interact with nature, uh, be it plant life or animal life. Um, they are definitely the most popular. And also because, for example, in Cambodia, uh, the government has given concessions on forest land. So to stop the people from coming in and cutting down the trees and logging illegally and to stop all the illegal wildlife trade that's going on, they've given actual properties, as long as that property can make money, they, get, they give it as a concession. So people can have that property for 10 years or 20 years. Um, and the money that's being made from the property, uh, you have to show that you're doing what you would call CSR projects, so corporate social uh, responsibility projects. So local engagement, um, for example, rangers in, in cardamom, um, mountains in Cambodia. Um, they work with the park rangers. So the rangers have now become the guides. They're the ones actually interacting with the visitors. Um, they've brought in a teacher to teach the guides English. So they're improving the, the livelihoods and the, the um, capabilities of uh, the rangers who would never have another opportunity. Because if they want, if something happens to them and they can't work, there isn't even another job for them to, to transfer to. They would have to actually leave the village or leave the area in order to go find work somewhere else. Um, then, of course, beach is the second most popular. Um, 
cultural. So cultural meaning it could be the middle of a rice field in Loi. So really about looking at local untangible heritage um, and setting up uh, an ETC somewhere in a very remote province um, so that they can immerse themselves in the local culture. Um, then, of course, rivers. So like the property um, from the Bilbenti connection, collection, they've actually built the property on the edges of a, of a, uh, a river in the forest where the reason they've had to go so much higher is once they started building, they realized, oh, it's a flood zone. This is when there's big, heavy rains. This is where all the water comes. So uh, they've made that they've had to kind of make them much higher than they originally wanted. And of course, um, golf. So there is certain uh, areas in Asia where golf is obviously a big thing. But sometimes you have to drive three hours to the golf course you want to play on. So ETCs are now becoming a you know, a stay on the golf course kind of option. OK. So does anybody here not know what the UN SDGs are? Everybody knows, right? OK. Um, so I'm going to ask you guys this. What do you think um, about each one of the, the 17 goals? How, does an e how do ETCs tie in to all of the UN SDGs? Let's start with Number one, ideas. So for example, no poverty. Um, an ETC built in a forest, the closest village, right? they tend to be quite poor. So here's a way to actually bring money into the local communities. Um, it's also a trade-off. This is where uh, I like ETCs, because it's a very easy way to show people that they can make money by protecting the source that brings the money, brings in the income, as I call it environmental economics. Um, so instead of you going and taking the wild birds or killing the wild pig or collecting the eggs, if you know where to find those things, and today you get $5 for it, stop taking it. I will bring the customers to you. They will, you will take them to see where the eggs are, where the wild boars are, where the deer are, where plant life is, and they will each give you $5. And they can come every day, because you haven't taken it away. So this is where the, the, um, the point on no poverty really comes into play. Um, zero hunger, again, by showing them how to manage their food source, how to grow multiple crops. Because uh, an ETC doesn't just need rice once a year, or doesn't just need tomatoes once every couple of months. They need seasonal produce. And they need regular produce to supply to their staff and to their uh, customers. So showing growing techniques or bringing in specific items that need to be grown for your own use, you're teaching the locals how to do it for themselves as well. So even if they're not making money from the food, you're teaching them the nutritional value of food. A good example of this one is um, there's a buffalo dairy farm that's been opened up in Laos near Luang Prabang. Now, these two women, American and, and Australian, had never even milked a buffalo. But one of the reasons they actually decided to do this was they'd been in Sri Lanka, and they had had curd and treacle. Curd is like sour buffalo milk. It's kind of like a, yo a hard yogurt. And treacle is made from the palmyra. It's like, a, like, like syrup, like honey. And it's a, they, wanted, they saw the buffalo in Laos, and they wanted to have curds and treacle. You've got the palmyra palm, and you've got the buffalo. Where's my curds and treacle? And they were, of course, told, nobody here built, milks the buffalo. Laos has got a very, very, very high level of malnutrition in children under the age of 12. It's really, really bad. We're talking about, uh, I think it's 37% of all children under the age of 12 literally are starving, even though they eat rice and pork every day. But that's not nutrition. So they started looking at it that buffalo milk actually offers a very, very, very high level of nutrition. And it's got no lactose in it like cow's milk. So a lot of Asians don't like milk because they're lactose intolerant. They're not used to it. But buffalo milk is suitable for anybody. It's very, very difficult to actually be allergic to buffalo milk. It's good for eczema. It's good for many, many things. But all the buffaloes on the Laos, that the Laos farmers have they don't milk them. They don't really take care of them. They leave them 
they bring them in to plow the fields or you know to sell them for meat. So they went, okay, how can we look at all these problems when the solution is right here? The buffalo is the solution to all these problems. So they bought, they, they started renting the buffaloes from the local farmers. They don't own them, they only rent them. They get them healthy, they get them, you make sure that they're in good condition, they get them pregnant, then they, they start the milking process. They don't separate the mothers and the calves. They feed the calf a little bit less in the day so that they can milk and at night the calf feeds normally. Then when they go back to the farmer, the mother and the calf are together. So the, this, business, uh, this business has, they're getting the milk to make cheese and ice cream and all the things that they need for their farm. They're educating the, the farmers about animal welfare and treatment. They're providing nutrition to the local kids. And then when they have the little ETC, the customers come to stay, the customers are also learning about not all dairy is bad if it's done properly. Not all buffalo meat tastes bad, not all, you know, if they're fed properly. Not all buffalo are bad to eat because they're full of parasites and they're sick. So it all works for the business module, for the community, for the, the customers. The staff are learning this. And a lot of the staff that leave now are, are going back to village, remote villages in Laos and practicing what they've learned on this buffalo dairy farm. So again, having the accommodation on the farm means that the people staying are involved in all of this. They get to see how the cows are milked, they get to see, they get to wash the buffalo themselves, they get to listen to how the, the farmers are, are trained. So it has a 100% positive impact on the, the local area. Um, good health and well-being, again, I, have you ever been to a resort where people are really sick and, and you know, everyone is coughing and sneezing? No, right? Because they would be sent home immediately. So um, good health and well-being, it's about the staff that work for you and about their families. And if you're hiring from the local community, again, it goes back into them. Quality education. Now, obviously, not every small ETC can afford to bring in teachers to start teaching everybody. but the training that they'll be getting when they're learning on the job is m more than they would be able to afford if they had to go and study in a, in a, in a city far away from, from home. So they're learning about good practices, responsible behavior, critical thinking, uh, customer service. They're getting, it's, it's more than just turning up to a hotel and you know being a chef. Because it's small and it's hands-on, people get a real um, chance to develop their abilities and talents. Gender equality. Uh, so far we've seen in most ETCs, because they're hiring locally, there is no preference between men and, and, and women. And there is no difference in how much they get paid either. You know, they get, everyone gets paid for the job that they do. Um, whereas we find, especially in tourism, that there's a big gap in, in gender uh, equality uh, Different countries, it, it changes. So for example, in Thailand, uh, we find that 65% of the hospitality uh, staff are actually women, not men. There's a much higher uh, female workforce in the hospitality industry in Thailand versus, let's say, Sri Lanka, where there's not even 10% of women in the hospitality industry because of the stigma. Because they think, if you're a woman and you go and work in the hospitality industry, you're basically asking for trouble. It's dangerous. You need to stay at home or work close to home. So again, ETCs in that regard can really help balance gender equality. Obviously, clean water and sanitation. So not only about clean water for the guests and the, and the people on the resort, but actually how it affects um, the communities and sanitation. So uh, an ETC that has been set up properly doesn't have drainage going into the river or into the forest. It would have the underground systems, the overflow systems, which you can use with uh, plants to actually in the water and so by the time it gets to the shallow basin does everybody here know about this system you've, you've seen it right so what they actually do is they build you go underground and you build like pools underground and you have a deep pool and then a shallower pool and then a shallower pool so it's like steps so the the majority of the of the dirty water of the wastewater goes into the deep pool first you um, it has uh, special bacteria uh, and enzymes that are put in and they actually feed off the dirt. 
if there's no dirt, that bacteria will die because they have no food. So there's no chance of it, of it escaping into the natural environment and, and causing any problems. All right. Um, so then, as the the levels fill up, it goes into the next shallower level. But all the the dirt has basically been processed in the deep one before it goes into the next one. Then they bring in plants, so things like water hyacinth, uh, which is an invasive species, but is actually a pretty amazing plant. Um, so this way that they're ensuring that if there is any water that's released for irrigation, for farming, for uh, being reused in, let's say, the toilet systems, so the whole system can be recycled, but also if anything is released, it's not going to cause any damage because it's already clean by the time it reaches the surface. Um, and again, setting up a system like this, if you show the locals, if you've got them coming in to do the work, they now have learned something that they can go back and implement in the village. Uh, affordable and clean energy, we all know about solar, we all know about wind, wave, <laughs> yes? And sanitation, yep. The main problems isn't actually natural sewage, it's the cleaning liquids and chemicals that exactly. we release in there. Yep. Would that actually help? That, that so, process? first of all, an ETC should not be allow, allowing any chemicals to come into the natural environment. Um, what you can do is you can make a lot of these things yourself using everything from kombucha vinegar, bicarbonate of soda. Um, if, you, if, if you want, I have recipes about all of these things to make natural soap, natural conditioner, fabric, dishwashing liquid, everything that have got zero chemicals. And again, that's something that you can get the local villagers to make. So you're creating an industry that, they, that supplies themselves and that they can sell to others. Now, um, if there's, let's say, 20 tents and somebody uses a bit of soap or conditioner once, you're not going to disrupt the whole system. But if everybody starts using it, then you're going to have a problem with all the SLSs and SLRs and all the chemicals that actually um, create uh, algae, algae blooms and, and kind of the stuff that we don't want in our water because it's suffocating and it allows the bad things to grow instead. Um, but that's one of the things that an ETC should have in its policies. So, um, you know, that if you're providing everything for your customers and you tell them don't bring anything with you, you could even have a bag check that everything that they bring has to stay with reception. You know, if they bring a plastic bottle or, or you know, a plastic bag or whatever, that when they leave, they have to take it with them. So that you, they could do the same thing when people travel with shampoo and gel and all the rest of it. Um, at the end of the day, you still don't want all your customers smelling bad. They still need these things, but there are actual alternatives. And it's a great way to make extra money. You set up a gift, little gift shop, you know, in the village. People can go there and buy all these things to take back with them as well. It's a, and a lot of the herbs and, and plants that you can use to make your homemade products are found in the vicinity and anyway. So, um, but that's, again, activities about doing workshops and and things while people are staying on the camp. Uh, where am I? Eight. So decent work and economic growth. We all know that one of the biggest problems in, in, in ASEAN is migrant workers and the migrant workforce. That people need money to support their families. They don't have work in the local villages. They go to cities, which is why you know, the metropolitan uh, dilemma and the growth of cities is increasing so much uh, on a year-on-year -on -year -on basis is because more and more people are leaving their communities um, in order to, to find job alternatives. If you are, if they are able to provide from their family to provide for their families locally, then you're not breaking up the family unit. You're not um, disconnecting people from uh, their ancestral wisdom and, and, and history. And I'm sure you guys all know about, there's villages around Southeast Asia where there's literally no one there anymore. A village from 300 people, there's suddenly nobody. Because as the family units have been broken by people moving away to try and find work, there's nothing to support the, the older people that have stayed behind, and eventually the, the village collapses. And um, this actually allows economic growth, so local investment. If, if the, the owners of an ETC are from the local community, obviously that's economic growth for their local community as well as for themselves. Um, and decent work. Decent working conditions obviously are a very big part of sustainability. The people side about it's not just how you treat 
the people that come to you. It's about how the, you treat the people that work for you as well. Um, industry innovation and infrastructure. Obviously, here we're talking about less infrastructure, but infrastructure that's been set up correctly. Um, innovation. Um, we've seen some pretty amazing um, problem-solving skills in, in eco-tented camps um, where, for example, they've started building and they've realized that the land isn't level or that there's going to be floods in monsoon season and how they can you know, fix the problem and solve it without having to you know, bring in experts. And there's a lot of very clever people figuring out uh, how to solve problems. And of course, this is when, again, local community come into play, why they're so important. Because they've been doing a lot of this stuff themselves. It's local wisdom, local architecture, that they know which way the wind blows. They know which way is not a good idea to put windows, because it's going to make it too hot. It's, it's using the information that's there and incorporating it into your business practices and, and, and your module. Uh, reduced inequalities, again, um, hiring girls to be local guides and not just boys, for example. We tend to find that most of the tour guides or the, the, the nature-based guides uh, and rangers are men. Here's a chance to actually encourage women to join. Um, if you get kids involved and actually give them a chance to have some fun with all these activities, you're encouraging them to go um, uh, along a route that, you know, to replace the, the older generation. Um, so they already know that this is good, this is not good, without being, dis without being disrespectful, of course. Um, and instead of only having foreign investment and foreigners coming in to run a business or develop it, you can set up a train-the-trainer. So yeah, maybe foreigners come in because they've got the experience, or not a, not a, a Farang foreigner like me, but a, a foreigner from the north of Thailand coming to the south of Thailand, that's also not a local. Um, that have got the experience and skills, and then you train the trainer. So they then start teaching people in the local community to basically be able to run and operate the business, and they can go set up a new one somewhere else. Um, sustainable cities and communities. Obviously, again, we're, not, we're, we're trying to move away from the carrying capacity of cities. So this is more focusing on sustainable communities. Um, responsible consumption and production, of course. And ETC can be 100% self-sustaining, self-sufficient and ensure that even if there is any waste that's produced, that they have a proper solution for it, that it's not just given to somebody else to solve the problem. They are accountable for everything that comes in and everything that goes out. Uh, climate action, well, obviously, they're going to be very proactive in planting trees and um, helping with wildlife rescue and release. Um, we all know. You're all at Sassine, so you all know what climate action is, so that should be okay. Um, life below water. Um, an interesting ETC that we've seen on the banks of the Mekong uh, is the fact that, again, they're growing their own fish and nets. Right in front of the camp, they actually have their own fish. So they're not taking fish out the river. They've got fish in their breeding. So when the customers order fish, they literally go and take it out the net straight to the kitchen. There's no food waste. And the bones and the things that are left behind are then uh, used to feed uh, the other animals in the, in the vicinity. Um, they obviously are encouraging um, clean water systems, um, kayaking, uh, boarding, all kinds of water activities um, that are non-invasive. So even things like um, uh, otter watching, which was something that we were doing in Cambodia, uh, it was amazing watching the little sitting, actually teaching people how to um, sit and watch and respect wildlife, so that you actually become, uh, as an observer, you're not there to make a noise, but then you watch why, what they're using, what they're building, what they bring, what is under the water that is of such interest to the otters, because not everybody goes swimming and is happy to put their head under water to see what's going on, but whether it's the sea, whether it's um, uh, rivers, lakes actually having activities that are not invasive that help people have a better understanding about the biodiversity in the ecosystem and why it has to be protected and preserved. Um, life on land, of course, this is everything nature-based, uh, animals, plants, so on and so forth. Um, peace and justice, strong institutions, 
Well, again, I mean, it's always nice if you can mitigate in the local community, whether it's uh, um, helping them deal with social injustices, land encroachment, their own rights, uh, whether it's religious um, conflict, uh, and of course, um, again, teaching your, teaching your staff and treating your staff in a fair manner and showing them that everybody deserves the same respect. Um, you're having an impact on them. So when they go home, and this now becomes part of, what, of the way that they operate, and their children learn from it, you're, you're changing the way people perceive things. And it's like, if you remove fear and replace it with understanding, you're not going to have hate. You know, it, you're going to be able to deal with peaceful situations very quickly. And of course, partnerships for the goal. So partnership is how, who do you work with, whether it's your uh, business partner, whether it's your local partner, whether it's government, whether it's private sector stakeholders, um, and ensuring that you have an effect on your supply chain. So your partnerships, whether they're internal or external, if you have these standards for yourself and you start demanding those standards from your partners and from your supply chain, at the end of the day, for example, if I go to the market and I buy five kilos of tomatoes every time I go, and the supplier always gives it to me in a plastic bag, and I go, I don't want a plastic bag. Here, I've made fabric bags from the sheets that were ripped at my ETC. Here's my, here's my produce bag. Every time I come, I'll give you a clean one, you give me one full of tomatoes. You've already changed the way that supplier is providing you with what you need by eliminating plastic from the supply chain. He is then, if he doesn't do it, you'll go, okay, I'll go to the one next door who'll do it. So you can actually have positive pressure and a positive impact on your partners and supply chain in order for them to fit your requirements and your um, standards. Now, none of this happens overnight, of course. This is all, it's one step at a time and it's like an escalator. You get on and you keep moving forward. But this is why out of all of the eco-accommodation models that we've seen to date, the ETCs are the only ones that can actually meet the SDGs and all of them. Any questions or comments at this point? Sure? <laughs> okay. All right. So um, this is the summary. ETCs are an important and financially viable module for social and natural development ASEAN sectors of hospitality, ecotourism, conservation, and responsible environmental practices with a rapidly growing demand from a consumer-based perspective. So here you've got demand. There are people who want it. It's a module that is 100% sustainable if implemented correctly. And I keep saying if implemented correctly, because you have to think about every single part of the process while you're developing and building it to make sure that you don't forget something like cleaning products. Um, and ETCs, compared to other existing eco-accommodation modules, are more viable and sustainable when implemented correctly. OK. Questions? What do you guys think about ETCs? Now with a little bit more information. Go, go, go! <laughs> So, um, based on right. So, based on what we've seen um, with the ETCs that have been opened in the ASEAN countries to date, um, you don't need as much planning permission because you're not building permanent structures. Some countries, like Thailand, um, if you're going, if you're doing it in an area that's considered one of the duster areas, so the destinations for sustainable development, if it's in one of those provinces. You're already getting big tax breaks, and they are very, very supportive. Um, governments should actually be encouraging this. Rather than them focusing, like in Myanmar, for example, um, the government there is huge on hotel development. They just want all the big everyone to come and build hotels. Why do you want all these hotels if you've got no customers? So you get people that were working in Thailand to go back to work in Myanmar, and they have no jobs because there's no people in all these huge, big hotels. And they should actually be encouraging ETCs because there are so many rural, beautiful, beautiful locations across Burma that you can't stay in because they don't allow homestay. 
So this would actually offer an alternative to homestay as well, because then a rural community could say, right, this is we're giving this land, it's going to be community land, and we're going to build our ETC here, so it's not considered homestay. Thailand. Um, ETCs could actually be more beneficial in the national parks than allowing encouragement and allowing big corporations to come and buy land to, to build hotels that are nothing but damaging. So um, because of ASEAN's regulations on sustainable tourism development, ETCs actually fit in with those regulations better than anything else. Um, so again, it's just getting this, this module uh, to the, the government sectors to make them aware of it, because a lot of them have never even heard of it. They just think it's a camp. They're like, well, if I want to go camping, I just take my camp and my sleeping bag, and I, it's like, yeah, no, that's not, not what this is. So um, because of the push towards sustainable tourism development, and because uh, PATA, like all of the big um, um, report writing uh, companies, if you like, um, that are providing the data, that are doing the research, and they all come up with the same information, that the demand for sustainable tourism and responsible practices within the hospitality sector is growing by more than 15% year on year. So actually, I think I've got my statistic for 2018 here. Hang on, it's in my notes. Uh, so... For sustainable development, yeah. So this fits in, and because they don't, they don't always know that it's an ETC. As I said, they 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 haven't quite figured out this whole module yet. Um, uh, where am I? So at the moment, there. This is 2018 report, obviously, because. Um, we don't have 2019 yet, and even this was, huh? Oh, I just updated it two weeks ago. So <laughs> I got, I was waiting for it. So um, according to the World Travel and Tourism Council, tourism contributes more than 12% of ASEAN's total GDP, and which is 4% above most regions in the world. And the current demand for sustainable products has increased by 27% from 2011. So from 2011 to 2018, and this is, what, this is what they have in the report. This is not, that's the information that they're getting when people are already here. But if they actually, because it's, you know, PATA and they're doing all these, if they collected this information from tour operators before the customers came, the number is much higher. But I'm, I'm reporting on us here, and I wasn't meant to do all the globe. Um, but, um, yeah, so, so this is a module that I think, if it's offered in um, places like Sasin, in hotel um, training centers, uh, actually educating agents and tour operators about these, um, I think the demand would be much easier to be filled because it's like, we want it, but we don't know that it exists. So really getting the information out there and sharing it. Um, the I think at this point, whether it's governments or agencies like DASTA, um, if they actually went, okay, we want to encourage this module, uh, you don't have to pay tax for the two years. Or you know, if you um, hire 10 people from the local vicinity, uh, they get their you know, medical insurance, uh, local government insurance uh, um, covered for the first two years. So, just like they give incentives to, to local investment and foreign investment for big complexes and amusement parks and hotels, they should be actually going, no, you guys need to pay us. You know, you need to pay us for what you're doing. Give us more money. You don't get any tax breaks, and the tax breaks go to the, the local entrepreneurs who are actually doing something that's uh, uh, beneficial both for, the, for the, their own local community, their own sense of a business venture, and, of course, the environment. Any other questions? Really? Guys, you are so quiet. <laughs> Please. Um, 
Yeah, it was very interesting. I can hear you, yeah. but I think it's fine. Uh, but I'm not 100% uh, convinced because uh, we won't be able to achieve sustainable society unless we change the cities, right? Very true. Um, but again, the, the whole point of the ETC is, is that it can be set up away from yeah, high density yeah. populations and, and areas that have over exceeded their carrying capacity. So the focus on that one, the ETC as a sustainable model for developing new destinations across ASEAN, yeah, yeah, yeah. if we look at the other three modules that exist at the moment, the green hotels, the eco lodges, and the glamping, none of them can actually fulfill all of the, the, yeah, the yeah, UN SDGs. I, I agree with you. Uh, uh, my question yes. is, um, you talked about uh, educating the local people, but um, actually my image of um, sort of uh, sustainable tourism is rather city people learning from the local people. Yes. Uh, well, it, it's a two-way yeah. interaction, yeah. for sure. Education, when I mean educating the local people, it means actually giving them uh, skills and knowledge that very often is based on their local practices and wisdom, but changing it to actually be more sustainable. So as I said, not telling the hunter, don't go into the forest to look for birds. You can still go into the forest for, for birds, but don't kill them. Take the photographers or the, you know, the bird watchers with, with you. So you're not changing the way, your, your way of life, but you're improving it and ensuring that it will be here in 10, 15, 20 years. And the activities that ETCs offer um, really are about you know, engaging with the local community. And it's not about, it's not like going to unfortunately, let's say one of the long neck uh, hill tribe villages, which is like a human zoo. Because there, you're not, you're going in mass tourism to take photos, maybe buy a souvenir. But you don't really get a chance to sit and learn and, and, and discover. So here, you know, uh, bringing in local guides. I, I'm interested in herbs, for example, you know, like for medicinal purposes. So the old lady in the village probably knows better than any anyone what to use if you have a cough, what to use if a child has a fever. She knows that this is a good root, this is a good seed. And ETC can actually create seed banks, for example. So they can go in because we know a lot of the, the stuff that falls on the forest floor doesn't get to grow because it's dense and not everything, you know, there's too much competition. Once a year, during different seasons, you can go and collect seed banks. And actually, so that you're, you're you can then use that to plant in other areas where there's been damage and get your customers to go with the locals because, again, the locals will know what time of year to plant, what grows next to each other, what doesn't grow next to each other. So really, it's about yeah, mutual engagement. So educating your customers, but also educating the people that, that work for you and, and the local community. Any other one? Because that was a good question. <laughs> Anybody else? I think everybody just wants to go and drink beer. Sorry? I think everybody wants to go and drink beer. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um, from what you know now about ECCs, would you actually go and stay in one? Would you say, okay, I want to go and experience uh, an eco-tented camp? Would you be interested? Would you? <laughs> Exactly the most strong structures. No, the structures are all, the structures will be strong because you're building, you know, they have a foundation yeah. that goes in. But remember, when you leave, those foundations can be pulled it out. Be, and, and, I, and I looked, I looked at those pictures. It looks to me like you could put your hands through the wall in some of those places. Well, but that's why tents don't have walls. <laughs> it's a tent. <laughs> and now with all the modern technology, you can, they actually make tents with like moving panels inside. So you can have a two-bedroom tent today. Then you take out the, the panel, and then it's a, you know just a normal one. You can make private corners. It's still just cloth. On bamboo structures. <laughs> yeah, but. So in other, no, it just and again the isolation, contributing so, to the lack of security or, or well, the risk threat, I would say. 
so he, again, that's a, a catch-22, right? Because it's secluded, chances are no one's going to come and rob your tent because they, they can't get there. Um, the, but then again, if some, but that's why there's normally somebody who's probably medically trained on site, uh, which again is a responsibility of you know, the management to make sure that all their staff have first aid training and at least one person on site at all times that can deal with a snake bite, with uh, you know, a twisted ankle, whatever it is. Um, again, any good business that offers tourist facilities and hospitality um, should have an evacuation plan. You know, should have emergency contacts if they need a helicopter or if they need a boat. Um, but that's all part of a, a good, healthy, you know, business yeah. plan. Yeah. Um, the reason for the for them not really wanting very young children in, especially at this stage, is also um, it's, there's certain people maybe when they travel that don't want they want to be in nature. They don't want to hear other people's children screaming. Um, and I think. Parents, when they travel with kids, they want their kids entertained so that they can relax and have a good time. So maybe in the future, the ETCs could actually, there could be specifically uh, family-friendly ETCs designed for that purpose. So great, this is the kids' club. Get all the kids going and you know drawing animals and making masks and having fun, while the parents get to go trekking with the guides or go kayaking and you know have a cocktail. Put the kids in the cages. <laughs> Put the kids in the cages. <laughs> I, but th 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 this would be healthy business competition. It would be very healthy business competition because you're not going to get three eco tents right next door to each other because the idea is that they're in remote, secluded destinations that don't have uh, you know, all the facilities already there. So this is a way of preserving your business module because it's, you're thinking long term. You can still have that same module in 20 years. Yeah, maybe every two or three years you might have to upgrade your fabric or replace, you know, some of the facilities. But they do that in all the big hotels anyway. Um, so it's actually, I think, a good business module and a healthy because okay, maybe somebody builds an ETC ten kilometers down the road, uh, and they are, you know, they've come up with a new technology or a new wastewater system or uh, a new way of uh, uh, facilitating um, uh, the release of. of um, animals back into the wild so you can learn from each other and you can collaborate but when you're small and you, you if you if you don't have 200 rooms and 300 members of staff it's enough that you have 10 customers every day your business is going to make money so I think it's it, it's unlike I know what you mean by like the hotels you know every week now in Bangkok a new five-star hotel is opening and the old ones are closing and this one's renovating and they're not upcycling the materials. They're not recycling the materials. It's all just waste. But they're doing it because I need a rooftop bar because they opened a rooftop bar. And this one did this. So I have to do it. So they're following trends that are not sustainable because people are actually moving away. People want this, not that. So, and because it's a small investment rather than a huge, big investment, um, less chance of you know, loss. But you can actually just pick everything up and move it. So it didn't work here. I'm going to go and set it up in a new location. And most of the stuff can just be moved, whereas a big hotel can't do that. Does that answer your question? Any more? Yes. Um, you were talking about uh, people moving toward this kind of tourism. But uh, from, from what I've seen about tourism, especially in, uh, you have like a Western attitude towards sustainability, sustainable tourism, and then you have a more Asian attitude, which is not as centered around. Yes and no. So um, there is more of a trend in ASEAN towards looking for alternative options because of social media and because of selfies. And they actually, not always for the right reasons, but they want it because it's unique and it's special. And they think it's cool and, oh, well, nobody else is doing it, so I want to be the first, all right? Whereas um, we've seen a huge increase in sustainable, the demand for sustainable tourism from countries like Taiwan. And Ta the Taiwan are big tourists, and they're actually looking for better options now. 
because, because they're practicing it at home. When they travel, they want to be able to practice it as well. Um, surprisingly, the Chinese, but not the big groups. There's a kind of higher level Chinese that now they're like, well, we're big spenders. So we want to get quality for the money that we spend, not just quantity. And again, they want to be different. They don't want to go where all the other Chinese are going. So there's, there, there's um, the reason that the one in Myanmar was built so quickly was because of demand from the Chinese market. Um, so again, the same that maybe 20 years ago when Thais traveled abroad, they didn't want to go and stay in a five-star hotel. They wanted to stay in a B&B &B or in a small guest house. Now when they travel, they want to stay in the five-star hotel. So these are trends that are changing. But I think if ETCs are not thought of as a niche market and they become more available, they will actually become, it's, it, they're more viable to become mainstream um, and, and stay there uh, versus whatever's trending at the moment. Because it's a module that, I mean, you can upgrade your tent, you can change the color scheme, you can offer, use local produce to make global inspired food, um, you, but you do it on site. And the food that's cooked is for you and your you know, partner or the guests at the table, and not a buffet and a Sunday brunch in a hotel uh, that half of it's been sitting there for two hours and the other half goes to waste. So, you know, this is where, this is why I, I always finish any talk I do with educate yourself and others about responsible travel and sustainable practices to ensure your choices benefit people, planet, and the prosperity of all. So, again, it's, it's all about when people know that there's an option and they understand why this is a good option, this is not a good option, People like to feel good about themselves at the end of the day. So if you know that your money is helping to keep the forest standing or teaching uh, the kids or fishermen how to swim, then you know, you're getting the same luxury and the same you know, unique holiday experience, but with a personal con connection versus spending the, s the same money in a, in a hotel that you don't even see the same person in reception every day. So I think this is a... Um, in ASEAN, it's a niche market. Uh, I have Thai friends who, when they've been to Africa on safari, I said, how was your trip? They were like, we stayed in the most magical tent in the middle of the felt I've ever seen in my life. I'm like, well, you, they were like, everything, was, they were so amazed. I'm like, you know you have them in Thailand. They're like, no. Like, yes. Khao Yai, Elephant Hills, Chiang Rai, the Khao Sok, uh, Khao, Lak, yeah, Khao Lak. There's more and more of them now in Thailand. But at the moment, most of Thais, haven't quite, because they, they don't even know what an ETC is, they don't know what to ask for. So, but it's coming, mark my words. And the market research, I mean, we're talking um, C9, like there's big corporations that do this research, um, which is where I've been getting a lot of my information from. Uh, because if I look online, try, try and search for an ETC or an eco-tented camp. It's all Africa and America. There's hardly anything. You have to specify countries. But they're collecting the information, and if the big hotel groups are investing in these already, you know, they know where to make money. They know what's coming next. So I don't think it'll be long before even, you know, uh, locals will be going, we're going to go stay on an ETC. Any other questions? No? In that case. So um, I've made this available, and there's actually, uh, for every slide, there's notes and like the research information and all the details. So if anybody's interested, I think it can be provided and shared. You need a photo? <laughs> yeah, photo, but then we get everybody in the photo too. Everybody come. <laughs> all right, so take one this oh, this way. Okay. Should I shake your hand? Hey, you want to? <laughs> Why not? Thank you. Thank you. Come down. <laughs> A little group cuddle. Oh, I have to hold this. Oh, yeah, because I shook your hand. <laughs> Wait, maybe. Okay. <laughs> Where are you going? <laughs> oh, oh, you want to turn that? No, no, he's turning the screen off. It's okay. Come back.
Don't be shy, I don't bite. I thank you all very much. I hope you found it interesting and maybe learned something today as well. Lot it mark, yeah, I know. <laughs>